Good morning. You all hear that a lot, don't you? We like to engage in this church. When you think about a door, what comes to mind? Maybe the door to your home or the door to your office, maybe a tall door, maybe a short door, maybe a metal door or even a glass door. What comes to mind for me are those two 10-foot doors that open to the front of this church because it takes every bit of strength and grunt to open and shut them. And anyone that's ever done that knows what I'm talking about. When you came to church this morning, you entered through a door, and when you leave today, you will exit through a door. In life, we are often metaphorically faced with different doors and choices. Some may lead to a better life or future, while others can lead to failure and defeat. In John 10, 7, Jesus refers to himself as the door of the sheep, or the gate of the sheep. In fact, all of chapter 10 uses the metaphor of a door or gate, of gaining access to something, and the idea of Jesus as the good shepherd watching over us. What does he mean by this when he calls himself the door? And how can we take this truth and apply it to our own lives? And why does he suddenly start talking about himself as the door of the sheep? Well, it begins in John 9 when he healed the man who was born blind. You remember the story? Jesus spat into the sand, created a pace. He put it on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he did and was able to see. And naturally, the man wanted to know who had healed him. So Jesus spoke to him and made another great I am statement. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, you would think that everybody would have been happy about this healing, but they weren't. In fact, some were very skeptical, and others even asked, was it even the same man? The Pharisees were doubtful too, and called for his parents and began questioning them to verify their son's identity. And they took a legalistic approach. In their eyes, this former blind man couldn't have possibly experienced healing since he wasn't healed in the way that they would have expected God to heal, and certainly not on the Sabbath. And after arguing with the man for a short time, they eventually kicked him out of the synagogue. They, they ex excommunicated him. Instead of rejoicing that the blind man had experienced a healing, they decided they would act as a block or an obstacle to access to God. And they were trying to be a door through their laws to God. This is why Jesus says to them in chapter 10 that I am the door of the sheep. There's no real break between chapter 9 and chapter 10. It's the same people. It's the same scene. Jesus is basically saying, I am the door, not you. I am the one who decides who comes in and goes out and who has access to God. So why does he use the image of being a door to the sheep or door of the sheep? He's using a familiar metaphor for those who are listening because it was commonplace to see shepherds and sheep walking around. At night, he uses the image of a sheep pen, which was an enclosure made of stones, uh, just high enough that the sheep couldn't get out, and it had thistles and thorns on the top so that predators couldn't get in. Uh, the opening of the shepherd of the sheep, I'm so sorry, I've lost my place. <laughs> the purpose of this sheep pen was to prevent the sheep from going astray. It was to give them a place of security and rest. And at night, the shepherds would bring the sheep in one by one, and then once they were all in the, sh all in the sheep pen, the shepherd would lay across the entrance to the pen to protect them so they couldn't get out and so nothing could get in. And it's this image that we see in John 10 of Jesus. Jesus is the only door, the only way to the Father, the one who watches over and protects and takes care of us. He made some very impressive statements about himself that should be very encouraging to us, the believer. Because in Christ alone do we find everything we need to live this life. So I could spend a lot of time talking about the shepherd and the sheepfold and all that. But I have three questions that I want us to look at this morning. Three things that come to mind. The first question is this. What kind of doors are you seeking instead of Jesus? John 10, beginning at verse 7 says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. 
A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So Jesus talks about life in all its fullness here and the life of abundance. But what does that mean, that life of abundance? In John's gospel, it also has the same meaning as eternal life. Whenever Jesus uses that phrase in the gospel, it's not only something that is reserved for the future, but it's something that we experience here and now. Eternal life also goes along with the phrase that Jesus spoke at the end of verse 10, where he says, I have come that they may have life and have it full. How many times do we try to experience life in all its fullness on our own, apart from Jesus? How often do we try to save ourselves by seeking our own doors that can become idols? Something we place over and above God to give our life meaning or significance. There are people who spend most of their lives chasing after the American dream and as a result fail in prioritizing what really matters the most in life. Their identity is found in their performance and their delusional reality of success. And we know that society judges based upon how much we produce. As long as someone is producing, they are meeting that expectation and sometimes that's the only way they find their identity and value. But when they're not producing, they don't have a real sense of identity or worth. Not only has their work become their identity, but it has also become an idol. It's only through Jesus that we truly find our identity and significance and purpose and meaning in life. It's not through performance. I think we've all tried that before, trying to be better, trying to be more efficient with our faith and realizing that we fail. Jesus is the door whom we find pasture and life in all its fullness, and there's nothing else that replaces that. The second question I want to ask you this morning, are there ways in which you are blocking or being an obstacle in someone's path to God? The Pharisees at the end of chapter 9 said that the blind man was born in sin. They believed he was undeserving of the miracle and that he couldn't have possibly had an encounter and healing from God. And being filled with such contempt for him, they threw him out of the synagogue. However, Jesus contrasts himself with the Pharisees and says, I am the door of the sheep. This man is deserving of being healed. How often do we treat others as inferior in some way? How often do we marginalize people by labeling them in some way and saying that they don't belong because they don't look like us, they don't act like us, they don't talk like us, or they're living in a lifestyle we disapprove of? And instead of welcoming and loving them, we judge them. Then we become an obstacle by not allowing them to see Jesus in us. We then become part of the problem rather than being a witness of Christ. We become a closed door, not allowing them to enter. And when we position ourselves with this type of inflated super-Christian ego, it's very telling and we should, it should be a warning that we need to examine ourselves, examine our motives, examine our hearts, examine our actions. And Jesus tells the Pharisees that he is the only way to God. He is the only way to eternal life and fullness of life comes only through him. As Michael reminded us last week, Jesus embodies the truth and fullness of God, the true identity of who God is. He is the only one through whom we can be forgiven our sins, and he is the only one through whom we can find eternal life. How often do we try to take things into our own hands to get someone to the kingdom of God? Maybe we think that if only they could hear a certain pastor or speaker or hear a certain message or read a certain book or attend a special event, then they will surely have an encounter with God. And we try to force them into that position. And please hear my heart. I'm not saying that we shouldn't share our stories and testimonies of our encounters in our life with God and experiences with God. We absolutely should. But we do it in a way that is loving and inviting. And then we trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest. The third and final question I want to ask you this morning is this. How and why is Jesus the only door through which we enter? Why? He says in verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. 
they will come in and go out and find pasture. So in the first part of this verse, Jesus says, if anyone would enter by me, and this is an invitation. It's an invitation to all. Jesus is inviting everyone, even the Pharisees. However, they miss who he is. As he invites them, they miss him. They are unable to see the door. And even though the light of the world shines right in front of them, they are still spiritually blinded. But in the second part of verse 9 is a promise of salvation. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He promises that all those entering through him will be saved. And this is similar to what he means in John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way. And it's through Jesus alone that salvation comes. He is the door of the sheep. All other ways, all other doors ultimately lead to death. Jesus is the door of life where we become a part of his flock. Not only is it a promise of salvation, but it's also a promise of peace. Jesus says they will come in and go out and find pasture. What does he mean by this? Pasture, as we know, is a place full of tender grass. A pasture is a place full of the supply of life. When the sheep are in the pasture, they do not like food. There's a beautiful passage found in Ezekiel 34 that I want to read to you, which says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forest in safety. I will make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. The trees will yield their fruit and the ground will yield its crop. They will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety, and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, and with them, and that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. So God says that he will make a covenant of peace with us, and Jesus, as we know, accomplished this with the redemptive work on the cross. But this is not just a peace, with him, this is not just a covenant of peace with himself, but it's with others as well. The peace of Jesus Christ reconciles us back to God, and it reconciles us to one another. In Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, we read the words of Paul about how Jesus has torn down the dividing wall between us. For he is our peace, who made both groups one, and tore down the dividing walls of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands, and expressed in regulations, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. And he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put to death hostility. So this morning, are you seeking to go through doors in life instead of Christ? Are you trying to be a door for someone else? You want to see them come to the Lord, but you're forcing them. I remember in my BC days, my before Christ days, uh, I, there were several people in my life that tried to force me into church, and it's like they were almost were angry about it because I wouldn't do it. You know, they were giving these tracks, these cassette tapes at the time, these booklets. They were always inviting me to, to functions, which if there was food there, I would, of course, go. But most of the time, I declined. But it was that sense of not allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work that only he can do. The ones that shared lovingly their testimonies are the ones I listened to. But it, yet, even with that, it took me a long time to finally say yes. So we don't want to be a door in the place of Christ being the door. And if you haven't, how will you respond this morning to Jesus' invitation to all to enter through his door, to enter through his gate? Some people are unfortunately on the fence about that. But this morning, if you would, open your hearts to receive what God wants to give to you. 
because his way is the best way. I've tried many, many doors throughout my life, and none of them have ever succeeded. They've all failed. And the one thing I love about Jesus, many things about him I love, but all these great seven I am's that we're talking about over the next few weeks, I am the way, I am the door, I am the light. And he goes on and he makes these affirmations which lets us know that he is the only way, he is the only door, he's the only light through which we find eternal life. Amen.